Hello and welcome to today's Converged, Hyperconverged, Composable Infrastructure and Integrated Platforms Megacast event. My name is David Davis from Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator for today. Today's event is produced by Actual Tech Media, and on today's event, you'll hear from NetApp, Pivot3, Datrium, and Robin Systems. We have a really, really great event lined up for you today. A lot of live demos. We've got some uh, video demo demos. We've got architectural diagrams, really cool stuff. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on today's Megacast. Now, before we jump into it, we have a little bit of housekeeping here and a little bit of uh, level setting, if you will, uh, before I introduce you to today's first presenter. Now, on today's event, you'll hear from four of the hottest players in the converged and hyperconverged infrastructure space. Each presenter will, will speak for roughly 20 minutes, followed by a live three to five minute Q&A, where I'll take questions from you, our audience. So I see a lot of, you know, hello from Cincinnati, hello from South Carolina, things like that coming in. Thank you for those. We really appreciate those. It's great to hear from the audience. Uh, but I also encourage you to ask technical questions throughout the event. We want to get as many, you know, technical questions as we can. There are no dumb questions in technology. So keep those questions coming in throughout the event. And I'll be asking the best questions to the presenters live and then uh, representatives from each of the sponsors today have technical experts on to answer your questions either during the session or during the uh, dedicated Q&A session uh, if we don't get to your question live during the event. Now, today's event is not a competition here between the presenters. This is not a smackdown. There's no winner being selected here today. This is an educational event for you. And we have asked today's pre presenters to remain positive and focus on uh, their technology solutions and how those solutions will help you in your real world IT organization. Uh, let's see, a little bit of housekeeping here that we need to cover. First off, prizes. On today's event, we have some awesome grand prizes because this is a big mega cast. We always do big grand prizes and we've got Amazon $500 gift cards after every presenter. So I'll talk in more detail in just a moment about the exact prizes and the terms and conditions that you uh, need to make sure you meet to be eligible for those prize drawings. I mentioned questions from the audience. Use that questions and answers box in your audience console as much as you can to ask all the questions that you have about today's presentations. We'll be getting to those as quickly as we can. We have hundreds of questions coming in. Um, I also want to point out that I'm going to be asking you, our audience, some questions. So I have some poll questions coming up here in just a minute, and I will be uh, sharing the results of those poll questions with you. So we encourage your participation in those and hope that you learn something about your peers who are on today's event from those poll questions. Uh, social, we want this to be a social event. I'll be doing my best to monitor the hashtag for today's event, which is HCI Megacast throughout the event as I'm also monitoring Q&A and also moderating. Um, so, but point being, I encourage you to tweet about the event and we'll be monitoring the hashtag. I'll be following anyone who tweets about the event. And, you know, we encourage positive comments, of course, over on Twitter and I will be retweeting those comments as well. And then resources over on the questions and answers box, just to the right of where it says questions and answers, it says handouts. If you click on handouts right now, you can see a list of handouts. There are four handouts in there. They are all PDF documents today. You can click on each one and download those directly from your web browser. Uh, they are solution briefs, white papers, sometimes eBooks, things like that. So make sure you check out those handouts. We have one from each of today's presenters. And then about your console, inside the web browser there, if you haven't noticed, it's kind of like an operating system where you have uh, windows, you have the questions and answers window, you have the slides window, you have the event schedule window if you want to pop that up down at the bottom. And you can drag these around, you can resize them, you can minimize them, maximize them. So I encourage you to maximize the slides window to make the most out of the presentation. And of course, maybe keep the, the questions box there handy as well if you have questions. I also want to point out that this is a completely live event. And as things do happen on live events, sometimes things go wrong, but not today. This is going to be a perfect event. I just know it. 
Uh, but we, I want to point out that we have presenters calling in from, you know, in some cases all around the world, uh, in, in every case all across the United States, and as things so, can and sometimes do, you know, we might have trouble getting connected with a presenter or something like that. And if that happens, I, I hope it's not going to happen, but if it happens, uh, I ask your, for your patience in advance. Also, if you have any technical troubles with the console, 99% of the time, if you simply press refresh on your browser, that will resolve any trouble that you have. If that doesn't do it, I encourage you to take the URL from the, the browser right there, copy it, close the browser window, open a private browsing or incognito browsing session, paste that in there, and that will resolve any other problems you have seeing the, the videos or anything, anything like that. Sometimes there's ad blockers or, uh, or uh, configurations that prevent videos playing. So um, if you have any trouble, try refresh first. If that doesn't work, try a private browsing session. If that doesn't work, send me a question over in the, the questions box, and I'll do my best to help you out. All right. Prizes. Let's talk about those for just a minute. We have five of the new Samsung Galaxy S10 smartphones. These are totally awesome. The brand new S10 smartphone. These are today's grand prizes. We'll be giving away the, these uh, grand prizes throughout the event. We also have four Amazon $500 gift cards, one to give out after each of today's presentations. Now, to be eligible for the prize drawings, uh, you must be on the live event. We do the drawings based on who is on the live event at that time. So make sure that you stay tuned. If you're watching this event on demand, I'm sorry, the prize drawings have already occurred. If you win one of the grand prizes, you must submit an IRS form W-9 to Actual Tech Media. That's a, a legal tax requirement, just like if you win the lotto. Um, and we have to submit that to the IRS because, of course, they'll want you to pay taxes on a, on a big grand prize. Uh, not our rules, but uh, we have to play by the rules. Uh, if you would like to read all the rules, feel free to go to the handouts tab and scroll to the bottom. It says prize terms and conditions. Click on those right there. You can also visit actualtechmedia.com. Scroll to the bottom and click on Megacast prize terms and conditions. Now, through the event series here, the Megacast and Ecocast events, we've given away thousands of dollars to charity thanks to generous attendees such as yourselves out there. If you win a prize and you say, you know, I've got enough technology or Amazon stuff already, and you would like to help someone less fortunate, we have the supported charities there that you see on the screen, and uh, we would love to help you donate your prize value to one of those charities. Now, as I mentioned, we want this to be a social event. You can follow HCI Megacast out on Twitter. I'll be tweeting about today's presentations. I encourage you to do that as well. You can follow Actual Tech Media for the latest in enterprise technology, and you can also follow me on Twitter, David M. Davis, uh, always talking about the latest in enterprise tech and uh, new events that we're running here at Actual Tech Media. Also, I want to remind you to subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook, and our iTunes podca podcast on Facebook and YouTube. You can click on any one of those. Those will take you to the respective sites. Now, before we jump into it with our first presenter here in just a few minutes, I want to take a moment to do a little bit of level setting when it comes to convergence, hyperconvergence, and you know, composable in infrastructure. And let's just start off with today's IT challenges. I mean, I was an IT manager and a system administrator for many years, and we faced a lot of the same challenges that I'm sure that you all are facing today in your data centers and in your IT organizations. And I try to sit down and come up with a list today of, of what I believe the challenges are. And of course, I always welcome your feedback. But um, I believe today, from what I hear from IT professionals out in the field, things are moving faster. Things are more complex. There's a lot more pressure on IT you know, than ever before. And the first, that brings me to the first point here, which is not enough time to do everything and too much to do. And it's kind of the classic challenge you know, they encourage you to do more with less, less people and less money, but you have a lot more to do. So I know that's a big challenge. Uh, you all are also facing demands to lower cost. You know, constant cost cutting is going on in IT. And then complex purchasing of new infrastructure. We need to replace aging infrastructure, but it's not always easy to do. We have legacy store, you know, SAN infrastructure, legacy servers, virtual infrastructures, all these things. 
And these projects that happen to refresh this infrastructure every you know, three to five years or whatever the time frame might be uh, can be very complicated. And it's complicated just to, to keep things running, right? Because when you have problems, there's a lot of finger pointing between different vendors. There's high cost and complexity for advanced features if you want to add you know, for example, some high availability or data protection or, you know, something like that, uh, they might charge you an extra license cost for that. And then I know many IT pros are struggling with, you know, performance and scalability issues, trying to do more. And I believe that companies are looking to the types of solutions that you'll see on the event today, converged, hyper-converged, composable, and integrated uh, solutions. And so I've come up with five reasons that I believe companies are looking at these solutions and five reasons you might want to consider these solutions that you from on the event today. So first off, improved efficiency. By converging things together, bringing everything together, you get improved management, um, decreased uh, you know, complexity, and you're able to do things much faster than ever before. So you'll see a lot of examples of that on today's event. Number two is lower cost by folding, you know, perhaps the storage into the compute or, you know, however, um, however things can be converged, you're bound to lower cost in some way. You know, the latest and greatest hardware and software is, is so much more powerful, you know, than ever before than the aging infrastructure that a lot of companies have in their data center. So they're able to do more and they're able to lower costs while doing it. Number three, simplified purchasing and support. Many of these solutions you'll hear about today, they have simplified support models that can help you to reduce the finger pointing, you know, that might be happening in, in your data center and in a lot of IT infrastructures and also reduce the, the number of support, you know, contracts that are required to maintain your infrastructure. And then there are included advanced functionality, you know, that you're, you're most likely going to get out of the solutions that we'll be talking about today. You know, maybe it's high availability for storage that's simply just built into the product or perhaps data protection, something like that is simply just built in to the solution. So look for advanced functionality built in in today's solutions. And then finally, I talked about it, I know already, improved performance and scalability. So I'm thankful today to have expert presenters from NetApp Pivot3, Datrium, and Robin all on to help educate us on their latest innovations in converged, hyper-converged, and composable infrastructure. Now, before we jump into it, I've got a quick uh, few poll questions here for you. So first poll question is, what is your industry vertical? And this is kind of a long one. You might need to scroll down using the scroll bar on the right-hand side of the slides window. Uh, and I will share the results of this with you so you can see what other industries are represented on today's event. Who out there is looking for greater efficiency in their data center with converged solutions? So select your industry vertical on that, and I'll share the results with you in just a second. It's always interesting to see, you know, what verticals are represented on today's event. And here are the results. So let's see, 10% healthcare, very nice. I like to see that 11% finance and banking, excellent. 19% technology, very cool. 14% or 11% manufacturing, very nice to see. 4% uh, retail, 5% higher ed, you know, a lot of good K-12 education, local state government. Uh, so real good representation across all different industries on today's event. So thank you for voting on that. Uh, Gary, let's see, Gary just said hospitality. Looks like that might be one we need to add on the list for the future. Excellent, thank you everyone who voted on that. Here's the next poll question and that is, how many people work at your company? Should be an easy one to answer. And I think that's always a good question for all the different presenters on the hyperconvergence events that we're doing today is, you know, how does your solution scale? If, if maybe you work at a small size company or maybe you have edge locations that need uh, some sort of compute and storage solutions, you know, do you have a hyperconverged or converged solution that could go at, you know, remote office type locations? And of course, I know the company size doesn't always exactly equate to, you know, the size of your infrastructure. 
All right, looks like a lot of votes are coming in. Let's get a few more votes. Thank you, everyone. All right, let me share the results of this with you. And it looks like 22% are at 100 to, one, to 500 size organizations. 19% are at 10,000 plus organizations. And a lot of good mid-sized companies in there, 1,000 to 5,000. That makes up 25% of the audience today. And then uh, some good representation from smaller organizations as well. Thank you, everyone. And then last poll question before we get started. And I'm very curious to see what your response to this one is. So the question is, which of these are reasons that you are interested in adopting hyperconvergence, convergence, composable, or integrated solutions in your data center? And the answers are increased management efficiency, performance and capacity, data protection and availability, lower cost, greater business agility, or maybe you have an infrastructure refresh or you're adding new infrastructure. And this should be a multi-select question, I believe. I believe it's set up as a multi-select. You should be able to select multiple answers there. All right, you might not be able to see the, let's see, I, I am not able to bring up the poll results on that, but I can tell you what the results are. So 25% said they're interested in an infrastructure refresh or adding new infrastructure. That's good to, to hear. So roughly a quarter of the audience is refresh refreshing or adding new infrastructure. Um, 19 or 18 percent are looking for improved data protection and availability, 14 percent lower cost, 15 percent greater business agility, 10 percent greater management efficiency. So good stats. Thank you everyone. If you can only select one, I'm sorry about that. It should have been a multi-select. But since it is just a single select, it's very interesting to see that the most popular option was infrastructure refresh or adding new security or new uh, infrastructure. All right, excellent. Well, let's get this mega cast started. It's now my pleasure to introduce Chris Rodriguez, Cloud Infrastructure Principal Architect at NetApp. Chris, are you with us? Yeah, I sure am. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for being on, Chris. Take it away. Great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, they call me C-Rod at NetApp because when I joined, they had five Christopher Rodriguez's throughout the world. So, um, And I've gotten used to that name. I've been at that for a real long time. Uh, and I know pretty much all our product base. So, And today what we're going to focus on is, is our uh, hyperconverged product and specifically one solution within our hyperverged uh, product. So we're going to talk about simplifying the delivery of 3D applications. You know, right now a big discussion going on is uh, GPUs, whether I need a GPU in my server or not. You know, for uh, for for different applications, and how do I know if I need a GPU or not? So we're going to we're going to talk about that. We're going to show you what our product and our solution is specifically around 3D applications. We will be at uh, for those of us those of you that are on the call. If you have any of your staff that are going to be attending. Um, the GPU GTC conference, the GPU Technology Conference next week in um, San Jose, California. We will be there. We'll have a booth, and I'll have uh, we have four different demos for different industries, specifically all four industries that were the top four in his survey. And uh, we'll have solutions, and I'll be showing the solution live on how we demo remote 3D graphics. But let's jump into it, okay? So we're going to talk real quick. Uh, I've already covered the introduction. We're going to do the challenges in the graphic workspace and go over that. And then specifically, we're going to talk about uh, the NetApp 3D open model, and then I'll, I'll conclude. Okay, This is just a 20-minute session, so it's just something to give you uh, a little uh, light interest in it. And I will talk about differentiators and, and what sets us apart. But um, if you have more questions, you can feel free to get a hold of me at crod1 at netapp.com, or again, I'll be at the conference uh, next week. So today, what we find with challenges with the graphic workspace is there's dispersed sites. Okay, Folks are all over the world, not just locally. Our solution has the capability to actually shear graphics from a central data center out to places all across the globe, in automotive, in manufacturing, in financial, 
uh, I had a financial customer come up to me, and we were talking, discussing, and they had uh, traders and brokers, and they were saying, "Look, you know, um, it's really important the graphics to these traders and brokers and their their desktops stay up 100% of the time. If they drop and they fall down uh, for any reason, it we can lose up to a, a million dollars a minute. I mean, a billion dollars in an hour, depending upon how the market swings. So it's extreme mission critical. I usually put them in healthcare in the same basket because in healthcare, I was just at." Um, a large hospital in Dallas is the largest uh, county hospital, public hospital in the United States, and it's in uh, Dallas, Texas. And I was with them a couple days ago, and we were talking about their PAX radiology and remote viewing and being able to share those images with doctors and pathologists and viewers from all over. And they were saying the same thing. You know, we've got dispersed clinics and everything else, and we need to be able to share those images, but we need real time. And, you know, our mission critical is, is life and death, right? Someone's on surgery or on the table or cardiac telemetry at the bedside. We've got to be able to to see those things. So not only do they have the deal with dispersed sites, dispersed sites and being able to share those images, but they also have extreme mission critical needs. The cool thing about our solution, and I'll mention this is our number one top differentiator of our HCI product versus the competition out there, is we have the capability to control IOPS and guarantee IOPS for certain groups of users or guarantee performance, if we want to put it in English terms, to service level uh, and meet service level agreements. So I can take those groups of traders on the trader floor and ensure in our conver uh, hyperconverged infrastructure across the platform that they can um, uh, get a minimum level performance regardless of what other users and whatever other workloads are on those on those clusters, those HCI clusters, and that's a great thing. The other thing is global access. They need to be able to re access remotely. You know, I've done presentations where I've done with uh, automobile manufacturers, and we have um, engineers in Tokyo, engineers in uh, in Detroit area, and then I was in Dallas, and we're all sharing the same images that resided in my lab in RTP, uh, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. So, and we were all looking at it, turning it real time and manipulating it. So, so that's the thing about this solution. It's real exciting global access. And then real time global collaboration. I just mentioned that uh, aspect of it. And then also you've got to meet those SLAs as I gave the example for the financial uh, area with tra traders and brokers and also in healthcare. Let's move on to the next slide and specifically talk about the 3D graphic workload history. So traditionally, Back in the day, I've, I've been uh, doing this for a long time. I've been around IT forever. And um, I was specifically, I started with Citrix back in the day when they first got started in 89, 90, and uh, worked with all their stuff. I started with Horizon View when they got started in the early days. And, uh, and now I've worked with other technologies. This technology here, if you look at the history, I remember going out when I worked for another manufacturer, and they flew me out to a, a big Air Force base, a test Air Force base. And we built this huge video wall to monitor in a big, big, huge cluster to monitor different graphics uh, back in 2006. What I tell people now, what used to take a whole computer room and a whole wall to do, we can do with two to four monitors on the endpoint on the desk, and we can do it in, a, in, in, in one rack size and get it all done. In some cases, even a half rack size of equipment. So if you fast forward 12, 13 years, it's just insane how dense and how fast everything's gotten. What we do is we package that all up and make it like an appliance for you, make it real simple and easy to deploy for you. And you don't need those big video walls anymore, as I mentioned, for your graphic designers and graphic usage or for PAX radiology. You, we can deliver above 4K resolution, all the way up to 12K resolution, to the endpoint in a VDI desktop across the globe. Okay, I do a demo all the time from our conference in Barcelona, uh, Spain, and our, our equipment, our pod, and our demos are actually in um, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. It's a lot less expensive leaving it there versus having to ship it and go through customs. And I do the demo, and I move PAX images, and I, you know, I uh, mess with uh, CAD CAM drawings and, and turn uh, different images and stuff in oil and gas and everything else. So it, it, um, it's a real exciting demo. And so we look at the history, and then we look where we're at today. This is a reality. I remember the first time I started working with this technology four years ago, I thought to myself, this is like compiling. When I first compiled my first program on an SSD, it was extremely fast, and I couldn't believe that, that it actually compiled. You know, now we're all used to SSDs in our laptops and in our enterprise storage and everything else. And now that's the type of, of experience you get when you, you see our solution uh, of 3D graphics on our HCI platform. Let me delve in specifically to our HCI platform. Here's another big differentiator between us and our competition. 
our compute nodes and our storage nodes are independent of each other, and we can scale independently of each other. But it's still under the same HCI umbrella, the same HCI GUI interface, and same HCI uh, management tools. So the point is, it's easy to deploy. You know, it has a real quick day zero input deployment, very fast is what you're looking for. It's easy to manage, but you don't buy, it's not common core, okay? Which, by the way, that's what Gardner defines as HCI. So we'll never be in the quadrant quadrant. And we, you know, frankly, we could care less if we are because I am visiting so many customers now that were early adopters at HCI and bought common core technology. And they're now going, man, I am so constrained with performance. I have problems. There's this extra resources uh, that you have to contend with all the time that are dealing with intercluster communication as well as, you know, storage and, and uh, compute node communication. And with us, we don't have that problem. Our storage nodes and our compute nodes are separate. If you need more compute nodes like you would for this type of application for 3D graphics with NVIDIA GPUs in them, you buy more compute nodes and less storage nodes. If you're in max data, obviously you would need more storage nodes than compute nodes, but you still get the same ease um, – and functionality of HCI. And this specifically is our one of our units with the GP unit. It comes with the M10 card. This is geared towards um, knowledge workers, VDI workers, Windows 10 workers that do a lot of video graphics uh, in the sense of, um, you know, like doing uh, Google Earth or um, or videos or video trading and things of that nature. And we actually tested 128 VDI users with Horizon View, and we're in the process of testing Citrix and desktop right now with it. And then also, like I mentioned earlier, we use a protocol called TGX by Mechdyne to deliver the high-end graphics workspace. This is a little bit about the NVIDIA uh, M10 card, okay? If you're not familiar with uh, GPUs, it has 5120 NVIDIA uh, CUDA cores because we put two cards in a, in a node. So it's 640 per GPU, and there's four GPUs on the card. Okay, shortly we will be um, uh, also um, uh, supporting the T4 card. At NetApp, we decided to jump over the Pascal line, the NVIDIA Pascal line, just because the power requirements for the P40 is, is almost identical to the M10. It's 250 watts of power and delivers a lot of heat. The T4 is only 75 power, uh, watts of power, plus it has tens of cores. So it falls into our strategy, which is what we say VDI by day, and then you can run AI by night, AI inferencing and other applications. Okay? So, so if we look at end-user computing and you look at our model, Here's how we can scale it out real quick and easy. We can go four at 128 gigabytes, or eight users at 64 gigabytes, dual 4K monitors, okay? Or we can go 16 at 32, okay? And this is showing an endpoint. Now, the typical endpoints we like is to have an NVIDIA GPU inside them. So like a little uh, Lenovo P320, uh, they cost roughly around $1,000. And, but that's a lot less expensive than these $30,000 workstations that we're talking for packs and, and other things. And, um, and that, that, you can, that will support up to five 4K monitors. Now, we recommend doing this when you do it in a VDI environment, just go maximum of four 4K monitors uh, with our solution. Okay? And we've tested all this. We have uh, validations and reference architectures built around this. We actually tested an 8K monitor with it as well. So it's pretty... 1.8K monitor. So at NetApp, when we talk about 3D graphics, and specifically with, with our uh, 3D HCI VDI solution, we literally take the desktops, the big, big high-end workstations, okay, and we move them into the secure computer room where everything's secure, and then we give you local or remote access where you can access it remotely across the Internet from anywhere. And like I said, I've done demos all the time. All the demo I'll be doing next week from GTC will be in GTC, but our equipment and our, our pod and our infrastructure, our HCI equipment, will actually be in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, in RTP. So you're talking about, what, 1,000, 1,500 miles. When I do it over the pond, over the sea, we're talking about 5,000 miles. And it's real-time rendering when I'm turning images and, and uh, demoing it. Exciting stuff. Okay. And again, as I mentioned, you get all the benefits of no power outages, you know, you very low bandwidth requirements when we do this. I actually use five megabits bandwidth at these shows because that's all they'll give me. And then the data stays in the data center, as I emphasized a couple times. Okay. We do partner with a company called Mechdyne TGX Protocol to deliver this. Citrix and, and, um, and, and View with Blast, uh, H.264. It's HTML5 uh, 4K resolution. It uses HTML5 um, for its codecs. They're, they're good. 
for single um, single um, monitor type resolutions and LAN resolutions. But when you start going and doing collaboration, and you need to collaborate more than, than one or two users, you need four users, and you start going with higher resolutions, neither um, Citrix HDX Pro or or um, view can reach those resolutions yet. So it's still great products. I'm very big on those products. Uh, we support them at NetApp heavily, and we have um, you, we use them heavily in VDI across the board. But um, when you start talking specifically about high-end graphics, you need something with a little bit uh, better resolution. And where Mech9 got its start was in oil and gas. So when you start talking about applications like Kingdom and Betrayal, that's a, a very intensive uh, GPU applications, and so it makes sense that now that we're, we're spreading the, the uh, solution across all markets, you know, the same markets that he surveyed, especially the high ones. This is the endpoint that I mentioned earlier. It's the uh, no, Lenovo P320 desktop, okay, it contains an NVIDIA P600 card. We can do hardware decoding from it, so we encode on the GPU, GPU at the server side, and then on the other side we decode. Now here's here's the key to this. You don't have to have an endpoint that has an, an NVIDIA chipset in it, right? It, it'll do, the software will do uh, software decoding. But you can tell the difference. And, you know, most of us IT professionals on the phone right now, we think, ah, that's no big deal. We can run that over this. But when you're dealing with um, traders and brokers or, or physicians or pathologists or you're dealing with um, uh, uh, CAD CAM graphics, they notice the difference. They can tell pixelization. They can tell slowness and performance, and they will toss that VDI desktop out, and so you lose all those centralization and security benefits, and they're going to demand a high-end expensive workstation. So it's important when you do this that you do it right. You just can't write it off. As IT professionals, we have a tendency to say, oh, that will handle everybody, and it, it actually doesn't. And so this, this is the key why I say we believe in NVIDIA at, at end-to-end -end and why it's very important, because you'll get a much better resolution. We also have a partnership with a company called Controller. And this answers the question that I started off with at the beginning is the fact that um, you're going, uh, if you need to find out if an application really needs the GPUs, GPUs are not inexpensive. They're expensive when you start putting them in the compute nodes and in the servers, right? And so what this application does, and I use it all the time on POCs, and uh, we download an eval of it and then, and then load it up, it allows you to see if that application is actually using the GPU and it's offloading from the CPU. So I tell customers real quick, you don't need our, our HCI with GPU nodes. You can just use our standard HCI product with no GPU in it if, if it doesn't need the GPU. Real great tool. I use it in my lab a whole lot too as well. And then, um, again, about our HCI product from a solution standpoint, I'm showing you one based on 3D graphics, but we have many solutions around our HCI platform. So NetApp, you probably know us years ago as being a filer company. That's years ago when I started uh, – working with NetApp in the late 90s, early 2000s, that's what we call it. And then we became a storage array company, and we supported multiple protocols and, and, uh, and uh, you know, fiber channel and everything else. And then we became, you know, a, a cloud company or a cloud company. And I really like to consider ourselves with our HCI product a solutions company. And you can see that is that we support, you know, various different um, platforms here, KVM, Hyper-V, uh, ESXi, Horizon View, and so on and so forth, okay? So let's talk about use cases. I mentioned a lot of them through the presentation. Manufacturing, CAD CAM, CATIA, SOLIDWORKS. I do a demo. You'll see it with SOLIDWORKS and characters that I have up on the screen, and I turn and change and modify. Um, you'll see, and it's real time. And again, all these images are not residing in San Jose, California, if you come out next week to GTC. They reside over, they'll be residing in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. So it's real exciting. Healthcare, I mentioned. Media entertainment with applications like Maya or Entertainment 4D. And, and then service providers for 3D desktop service. Our HCI product and our solution, you know, which gets shipped like an appliance, is ideal for these type of, uh, of environments. So, um, again, uh, bringing it better, back, back together, okay, NetApp 3D HCI simplifies graphics. It handles those four things that I mentioned. It lowers the total cost of, of, uh, of uh, cost of ownership because it takes those expensive workstations off the desktop, those packs, radiology, remote viewers, or viewers, workstations that you need. It increases productivity. It gives the solution that they need. You know, I, I can give you examples over, I've been probably visited um, 
60, 60 customers in the last year with this solution, and it's just amazing why you hear their need for that. You know, one of them had images that were being copied uh, by, you know, and, and interns were college students, and they were copying them on thumb drives, taking them home and working on them. They wanted to secure them and put them in the data center, but still they needed the, the quick response time to be able to modify those images and see the graphics. So, um, you know, security is a big thing. And then accessibility, and then um, you enable IT, as I mentioned at the beginning, you enable IT to meet their service level agreements because of the fact that we can guarantee certain groups a level of uh, service, a certain amount of IOPS, and uh, they won't suffer in a, in a shared in infrastructure environment. Specifically, these are the three uh, main things. We're flexible with design, simple operations, and we can predict performance. So I can, I can like I said, I can guarantee certain groups or certain individuals uh, the proper performance that they require and they need. We have a maximum too. We can limit certain groups to not to go over or cer certain individuals. Like I've got a group of Oracle database programmers and they keep doing RMN dumps at their lunchtime and they're bringing our processes at night down. Okay, I can, I can actually say, okay, I don't want these guys to go above this amount of performance. And so it may take them a little bit longer to do their RMN dumps, but on the other hand, you know, to test their applications locally. But on the other hand, I don't affect the others. So we're very strong in that area, and we can do it up throughout the whole the whole hyperconverged stack, which is the awesome feature of that. So I want to say thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Um, I've got folks on the answering questions, so if you've got questions about it, this is just a, a, a short video. I, if, if you're really interested in this, I'd encourage you in, in getting back with us, and we can show you a full demo, even from your site. We can demo uh, these 3D graphics remotely. Exciting technology. We've been working with NVIDIA for a long time, and, and uh, I do know uh, the NVIDIA GPUs real well. I I'm, I'm work with their engineering, their TMEs, and we're actually doing a reference architecture and testing with uh, one of their tools right now. So, so it's exciting times, exciting stuff. And again, if you're going to be in San Jose area next week, you want to stop by GTC, come on by and, and uh, ask for C-Rod in the booth, and they'll, they'll bring you right to me. And we have four great demos uh, there with the various different markets that are on the call. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great presentation, Chris. Really cool stuff. Uh, I wish I could be there and see that demo myself, actually. Uh, hopefully, I can catch that at another conference. But um, we do have some questions here for you from the audience, if you're ready. Sure. All right. Let's see. While I do that, actually, I forgot. Let me pop up this slide. And the question on the screen for the audience out there is, what additional information would you like about the NetApp solution? And just check the box there. It's a multi-select question. So see, uh, Keith is asking, does the video allow for a second monitor when accessing RDP remotely? So we don't use RDP. RDP is remote desktop protocol. We use uh, TGX. Unfortunately, RDP, and I've tested RDP, BLAST, PCIP, uh, ICA, I've pretty much tested all the protocols. And, and I, I co collaborate with some of my other colleagues in the industry as well. And, um, and those protocols, unfortunately, um, won't render the higher resolutions and the speed that we need them. So, so we normally go with the protocols TGX, and it does allow multiple individuals, people, to uh, look at the same image, and they can be across the globe. Like the example I gave with the one of the car manufacturers that we had engineers in Tokyo, Michigan, and I was in Dallas, and the actual my my pod resides in a in our in our NetApp uh, labs in in uh, RTP in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. So we can collaborate on the same, or you can have two to four 4K monitors on the same endpoint. So if you have an engineer uh, that needs four monitors, which we find it, you know, very common, uh, four 4K monitors or two 4K, 4K monitors, we can do that with our solution, yes. Okay, very nice. And so what's, what do you think is special about the 3D solution from NetApp? Well, the three things, as I mentioned, number one, we, we can, you know, guarantee certain groups like traders in the financial district, uh, guarantee them a level of service. Uh, number two, the other thing is, is that we, um, we can deliver these images remotely at extreme high resolutions. I got a hospital that we're getting ready to do a pilot in, and we're talking about, for um, diagnostic purposes, remote viewing. So their remote, their physicians at remote clinics can collaborate with, with the um, – pathologists in the main central big city hospital. It's one of the, uh, I believe it's one of the federal hospitals. And, um, 
and they want to be able to collaborate. And, you know, these clinics can be four or five hours away from the major city, right? And they want to be able to collaborate and share the same image. So that's the second thing. And then obviously the, the third thing is the fact that um, we can, um, you, you know, we can grow compute nodes and storage nodes independently of each other. So, so if you start off with a pilot and you, you put in, say, um, two or four compute nodes with GPUs and then four storage nodes, and then you decide you want to grow it, okay, hey, we love this thing, it's great, now we're getting a lot of users on it, we're going to go from, you know, so many users to, you know, so many users, say, from 200 to 1,000, well, I can add compute nodes with GPUs in them. So it's those three things that are the, the main differentiators about, about our, our solution. Okay. All right. Well, excellent. Well, I think that's all the live questions we have right now, but a really great present, really, really great presentation, really insightful. Thanks for being on today, Chris. You bet. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you having me on. For more and again, if on it, NetApp, oh, yeah, I was going to mention, if anybody has any questions outside that you, you don't like answering on a big form, you can shoot me an email at crod1 at netapp.com. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. All right. For more information on NetApp, make sure you check out your handout tab right there. It's a, there is a handout in there from NetApp entitled VMware End User Computing with NetApp HCI and NVIDIA GPUs. It's a really uh, comprehensive white paper. Make sure you check that out. There's a lot more detail in there uh, on top of what Chris just presented. And with that, it's time for our first prize giveaway on today's event. We have our first gift card, an Amazon $500 gift card going out to Devon Doreen from South Carolina. Congratulations, Devon from South Car Carolina. And our first grand prize is going out to Dean Arndt from Wisconsin. Congratulations, Dean from Wisconsin. We'll reach out to you to deliver your prizes. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenters on today's event. That is uh, Mr. Vikram Bella Prakar, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Pivot3, and Keith Hagman, Senior Technical Marketing Engineer. Vikram and Keith, are you with me? Yes, Chris, thank you. Thanks for being on. Take it away. Thanks a lot. Good morning, good afternoon, guys, uh, based on where you are. My name is uh, Vikram Belapurkar. I do solutions marketing for Pure 3. Uh, with us also, we have uh, Keith Hageman, who's our uh, uh, technical marketing person uh, for uh, HCI Solutions. We initially had a plan uh, to do a demo. I was just going to run through a few slides uh, just to introduce the platform and then hand it over to Keith to do a demo. But we've had some weather issues in Colorado with uh, recent uh, uh, blizzards. And so we're not able to reach our technical marketing lab. So what I've done is I've changed slides a little bit. I have more slides that explain architecture. So what I'm going to try to do is go through some of the architectural features and sorts of outcomes that we deliver for various different use cases. All right, so uh, just first of all, a quick introduction of uh, Pivot3. Uh, for those of, us, uh, those of you who may not have uh, heard of us, so we've been in business for, from 2008. Uh, we've been shipping hyper-converged infrastructure since 2008. Uh, if, you, if you can uh, uh, recall that probably before, HCI was even a category. Uh, we, today we have customers in over 63 countries, more than 3,000 customers uh, across the globe. Uh, and really, we started our journey uh, uh, trying to solve the problems around you know, how do we handle the high ingest uh, streaming sort of data for really the uh, mission critical surveillance sorts of deployments. And since then, we have evolved our platform uh, for data center users as well. Uh, in, the, in the process, we've added a number of innovations to our platform. Uh, some of those are around NVMe optimization, erasure coding, as well as software defined storage. And so I'm going to go through some of those features uh, down in this uh, presentation as well. All right, so just, just for uh, level setting, uh, HCI, is customers are moving from traditional three-tier infrastructure to hyper-converged infrastructure. What you see on the left is the three-tier infrastructure. Uh, really, the architecture was designed pre-virtualization, and really it is inadequate for the highly dense nature of virtual deployments. And HCI provides you that more, more of a scalable, modular, uh, uh, modern infrastructure that is suitable for these virtualized high-density environments. Uh, you see a quote from Gartner there. So HCI has seen, they're expecting HCI to see about 46% growth through 2021, and that's probably the highest of any new technology has uh, observed. So performance, scale, and efficiency are, are three attributes we are known for in the market. Uh, from performance standpoint, uh, the way we, we, we are architected, the way we make use of NVMe technology, allows us to provide uh, really high and consistent performance. 
especially when you're looking at consolidating multiple mixed workloads. Uh, from scale stand, uh, standpoint, we have uh, numerous uh, deployments with over 10 petabytes of data under its management uh, across many uh, industry verticals. And uh, these deployments are easy to scale. Uh, they perform at the large scale, and uh, most importantly, uh, they are really simple to manage even at that large scale, multi-petabyte scale. Uh, many, many a times that's usually handled by a couple of IT generalists. And from resilience standpoint, uh, you know, we have one of the, uh, the, the way we are uh, handling for tolerance and high availability allows us to provide uh, you know, better resilience compared to other HCI platforms uh, while making sure the performance uh, does not deteriorate uh, with resilience and the, the capacity or penalty or uh, overhead for our resilience is quite low compared to what uh, most other platforms do. All right, so the Pivot3 intelligence engine, really uh, Pivot3 intelligence is, is an intelligent framework that manages the architecture underneath it. And uh, it has multiple aspects to it. From performance standpoint, the intelligence engine, uh, based on a policy-based framework, you're able to ensure uh, performance prioritization for, for various different workloads. It also ensures the appropriate data placement uh, between the various different data tiers or media tiers that we use. Uh, data protection is also part of that uh, uh, intelligent framework that, that allows you to prioritize your data protection activities. We recently added some security features around uh, encryption and key management. They are also part of that policy-based framework allowing to, you to manage those workloads uh, in, in a consistent manner. And from monitoring analytics standpoint, uh, we are uh, some, of, some of the things like uh, phone home capabilities, proactive diagnostic, allow you to proactively uh, realize what's, what's uh, the things that may be going wrong with your system and fix them without, uh, without any downtime. So uh, at, at an architecture level, it's a distributed scale-out architecture, but it's an NVMe-optimized architecture. What you see here are the multiple tiers that we use intelligently. Uh, these tiers are managed by our uh, uh, policy-based quality of service very actively, very dynamically, and in real time. It allows you to really set the priorities for your workloads, and the system essentially takes care of uh, data placement on various different media tiers based on the priorities set by the users, as well as the, uh, the workload characteristics and its uh, I.O. patterns. It really, I mean, the, the, this sort of architecture allows you to consolidate multiple mixed workloads on a common shared uh, industry standard platform. So here's a quick demonstration of how that sort of uh, functionality, uh, leveraging a quality of service and, and uh, various different tiers can be useful. What you see on the left side is, you know, a couple of workloads that you may have in your environment with different priorities for your business. Our policy-based framework allows you to really simplistically assign policies or priorities to these workloads uh, the way they make sense to the business. For example, in this example, there's an order database, there's an analytics application, and there's a development database. They have different criticality for business. And so based on that, you can set the policies appropriately. For example, the order database probably is the most important database for the, for the company, could be set admission critical policy. Analytics application, while important, is probably not as important as order database. So you can set that at business critical policy. While the development database uh, you know, uh, can, can, can be set at a lower non-critical policy. And what, once you do that, system will understand that and system will keep optimizing based on the access pattern. In the event that the higher, higher priority workloads are not driving any performance requirements, the lower priority workloads will get the higher performing resources. But as soon as that changes and the higher performing workloads start needing resources, they will, be, uh, they will, they will get the appropriate performance uh, uh, by, by, because of this automated uh, 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 tiering and the policy-based quality of service. So you see in, in this example, the order DB starts experiencing more transactions and the system will automatically throttle the right workloads at the right time. And this is really, I think, a key uh, when, you, when you're thinking about consolidating multiple mixed workloads that may have different uh, business priorities. Uh, you can think of it as, you know, in VDI, for example, virtual desktops, you can think, think of different classes of users, assigning them different policies. In a big data sort of uh, deployment, you can think of different data tiers, hot, warm, cold data, you can assign them different policies uh, to make sure the right, uh, right data bucket gets the right uh, performance really simplifies how you can assign these policies and how system will ensure the SLS behind the scene while guaranteeing the level of performance that is required. Uh, from security uh, policy standpoint, intelligent security policy, that's part of our intelligence engine uh, framework. Uh, these, these, uh, we offer encryption, data uh, risk encryption, uh, along with that uh, standard space key management. 
so integrated key management that complies with the KNF standards can be used with our encryption solution. What is unique about our solution is really our solution leverages some of the Intel API to be able to offload these, uh, these activities, encryption activities to the CPU, and thus the overhead for our encryption is next to negligible. When you, uh, when you compare other encryption solutions, they can have anywhere between 20 to 50% overhead for encryption. In our case, that overhead is absolutely negligible. So there's no performance impact because of this uh, encryption. So you can encrypt the data sets that you want to encrypt without having to worry about the performance implications. From data protection standpoint, what you see here is the way we are handling uh, our fault tolerance. In many of the HCI system, fault tolerance is handled by really essentially uh, replicating data across the nodes. So if you have a three node system, typically you will see that data from node one is replicated to, data, 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 to node two, data from node two is replicated to node three, and data from node three is replicated to node one. And that's what you see in the straight line you see in the middle. That's a two copy uh, replication. What the problem with that is you have 50% usable capacity. That's one. Uh, secondly, you know, every right IO is becoming two right IOs. So uh, it's, it's, it's uh, capacity inefficient. It steals the IO from the workload. In our case, what you see the orange line up top is the sorts of efficiencies you will realize as you scale your cluster. So much higher efficiency in terms of capacity, much higher fault tolerance uh, also, uh, as well as uh, you think of the performance penalty of doing this uh, erasure coding is much, much less because we're not duplicating those right IOs. So higher performing, uh, uh, higher performing fault tolerance with much, le much less capacity uh, overhead required for that. And what you see here is a flexible, scalable architecture that we offer. Our systems are available in various different form factors. Uh, for example, you can, you can uh, make use of our software on the offering on a qualified hardware platform if that makes sense for you. But we also offer appliances, pure three branded appliances with our software loaded on top of it. You can choose between one year or two year boxes. You can see there are a number of configurations as far as the CPU, RAM, uh, and NVMe storage is concerned. Uh, we also offer storage optimized nodes or computer optimized nodes. And they're really uh, uh, useful in a situation like VDI, for example, where you may not need more uh, storage or IO capacity, but you may need more compute. And the compute nodes can help simplify the scaling of the infrastructure while keeping the cost down. In a big data sort of a, a deployment, over time, you may retain more data. Uh, and uh, as a result, you may need more storage, but you may not need more compute. In that case, our storage need, uh, nodes satisfy that need very uh, cost effectively. What you see on the right side is the way the system scales. It's easy to scale, it performs at a large scale, and then uh, managing it at, uh, at large scale is really easy as well. Multiple system at multiple locations can be managed as one domain from one interface. So it really simplifies uh, how, you, how you manage your uh, infrastructure at large scale as well. Uh, in terms of the extensibility, you know, so there's something, one of the unique things about our platform is the way it interacts with the rest of your IT infrastructure. Uh, many of the times, HCI creates an island of itself within your IT environment. Most of the time, the systems outside of the HCI, the VMs and workloads outside of the HCI, cannot access the storage resources on your hyperconverged infrastructure, or the VMs or workloads that are on hyperconverged infrastructure cannot access storage that is outside of that. Uh, hyperconverged infrastructure cluster. In our case, we facilitate that sort of uh, data exchange with a simple iSCSI connectivity. It really simplifies how you can scale your, how you, how you can migrate from your existing infrastructure, 3 d infrastructure, onto hyperconverged. It simplifies migration processes. It simplifies our upgrade paths. It really allows you to flexibly uh, move your infrastructure from older legacy infrastructures to a modern Pivot 3 infrastructure. In addition to that, uh, Pivot 3 platform connects seamlessly with uh, uh, with many other cloud uh, providers. Uh, our uh, native Acuity Cloud Edition allows you to really uh, uh, enable data mobility between your uh, private cloud, your three private cloud, uh, on-prem and, uh, and, and the public clouds using simple, uh, uh, simple management framework. Too. So uh, on this slide, I'm gonna show you some of the uh, competitive uh, you know, uh, performance uh, benchmarks that we've run and the performance we were able to realize. So this one uh, talks about the transactional performance uh, using a, a, a transactional workload. You see across the board we are performing uh, better, but what's, what I think was more important uh, is in terms of IO, 
a lot of, if you look at the center one, a lot of, uh, we, we provide uh, more IOs in general, but our IOs, a lot more IOs are of lower latency compared to competing solutions. Now this is being compared on a three node pure three HCI versus a four node competing HCI. So less hardware, better transactional performance uh, as a result of this architecture. Now you take it to virtual desktops, you'll see the sorts of densities that we are able to offer are also much higher than our competition. And this is uh, done using industry standard load testing tool, Login VSI. And these numbers are publicly available on Login VSI website as well. So in VDI as well, we're able to provide better density because of the way uh, we're able to uh, optimize performance and uh, reduce, uh, uh, reduce the hardware required. Now here you see transactional performance in terms of transaction also. When you compare a three node pure three cluster with a four node competing cluster, it, it, it performs and uh, provides better transactional performance as well. This is, uh, uh, no, we, we uh, did a reference architecture recently on uh, Splunk, and this is the result of that. What we were able to do is we used a hybrid solution for that, given it's a data intensive nature uh, and, and, and cost effectiveness as, as being a key criteria, we used a hybrid solution, a three node hybrid solution was able to sustain ingest rates to be able to do 13 terabytes of ingest in one day. Now that is, a, a, you know, I've, I've usually seen on a higher end uh, demanding uh, big data deployments, the ingest rate, rate can be high, as high as a couple of terabytes. 13 terabytes is a sort of uh, in, indexing rate that this cluster would be able to sustain uh, pretty much any uh, environment ingesting a large amount of data in it. From a search as well as the indexing performance, you see on the right side, search performance across the board, whether they're dense searches or uh, rare searches, our performance is uh, quite, uh, uh, quite excellent. What that means really is the, the, the response times for the queries are low. So uh, the operator who's working on this uh, big data application uh, to query the data, it, it, it's gonna be a lot more productive. If there's an application that is querying the data on the Splunk cluster, that application is gonna get that data much faster. So it's gonna be able to do a lot more transactions. So all of that means you know, better search performance, better indexing performance with a simpler hybrid configuration. And now in this uh, scenario, for example, in big data environment, you have different classes of data. When we did this exercise, we really used uh, the policy-based quality of service to handle those data buckets. We assigned you know, policy one to a hot, hot bucket, policy four to cold bucket, and so system really automatically took care of making sure the right data is getting the right performance while delivering these sorts of ingestion search rates. And all of that boils down to really uh, a better value for our customers. Uh, you know, whether it's a transactional performance or a desktops, uh, we are able to deliver better uh, uh, dollar per desktops or better dollar per transaction as a result of that. So just to summarize, right, the high density, the way, the way we are able to uh, deliver high density using the NVMe optimized architecture and the quality of service uh, really translates into you know, better performance, less hardware that you need as a result of that more predictable performance, the quality of service engine uh, that, uh, that monitors and governs the performance that our systems deliver, ensures that the system will be performing uh, day after day the same, uh, the way they're designed to be performed without any manual intervention. It takes away a lot of performance management activities that are involved in a typical uh, management of environment. Simple policy-based management, essentially the policies that we offer allow you to manage your infrastructure in a very simplistic manner. And the resilience, the way we're doing fault tolerance, uh, allows us our systems to be a lot more resilient, uh, available pretty much uh, always, uh, while making sure the, the, the capacity overhead of that uh, resiliency is, is minimal and the performance impact of that resiliency is negligible. So some of the solutions in which we optimize our infrastructure uh, in, in, the, in the data center or hybrid cloud space you have numerous, numerous deployments uh, in VDI space, many, many of those, several thousand desktops, many, many more than 10,000 desktops. A lot of those uh, utilize our compute nodes to optimize the infrastructure. A lot of those are GPU intensive uh, 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 environments as well, where we use NVIDIA GPUs uh, quite extensively. Uh, on the uh, data center modernization slide, this open policy-based framework allows you to really build a flexible uh, foundation for your uh, private clouds there. Business continuity, uh, disaster recovery, many of the MSPs who are providing uh, DR as a service or backup as a service are using our platform on the back end uh, to provide that service predictably. 
from enterprise application standpoint, whether it's consolidating applications or providing that transactional performance. Our, our platform can deliver that performance with a lot less hardware. On the big data analytics side, we, we've had uh, deployments where customers are able to simplify instead of using two or three different storage solutions to manage their data performance needs. Now they can do that on a simple shared uh, policy-based platform. On the IoT solutions, uh, you know, we have numerous deployments. Uh, many large cities running their smart operations on us. Uh, from uh, many of the transport operators and transit authorities in the U.S. and around the world uh, run their operations on Pivot 3. Um, there are many casinos that, that are run on a safe campus. When we look at campus, for example, we, look, we think of it as a, uh, you know, a, a small mini town or a, or, or a building. So many of these malls, things like that, we look at, think of them as campuses. Uh, they run on Pivot 3 as well. And then lastly, the, the airports, many of the airports in the U.S., as well as around the world, they're running their security operations on Pivot3 in this IoT arena as well. So unfortunately, we don't have a solution demonstration. So what I'm going to do is uh, take any questions you may have, but I'd encourage you to go to pivot3.com slash solutions. You can find a number of reference architecture and technical proof points around uh, various different data centers as well as the IoT solutions there. Great, great presentation. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, I believe we do have Keith on the line to answer technical questions as well. Is that Keith? is that right, Keith? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks for being here. Um, so let's see. We do have a, a first question here for you from the audience. And while we do that, I'm going to pop up this poll question uh, for the audience. It says, "What additional information would you like about the Pivot Three solution?" I'll just leave that up there while we do some Q and A. So a uh, first question here, Matt is asking, and, and maybe Keith, you understand this more than I do. Uh, if not, we can take it offline and, and get back to him. Uh, the question is, can port mirroring be configured on this, and will it need to remain downstream? I'm not sure about this one. So Okay, we'll get back to Matt on that one. Um, okay. The, ne the next question is about Pivot3, the solution. Is it is it hardware? Is it software? Do you sell both? How does that work? I can take yeah, that question. Uh, Go ahead, Vikram. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's a very flexible uh, solution, right? So if you have a, a – we qualify certain hardware platforms. And if you have them existing in your data center, uh, you can buy software from us, uh, and, and you can uh, install it uh, on, on your existing hardware. So that's a software-only or software uh, uh, fulfillment method. But we also uh, offer appliances, for example. And so you, you can buy appliances, one new to your appliances with various different uh, resource configurations uh, from us as well. If you, have a, uh, if you have existing relationship with any, any server vendor and if you have a way to source that uh, more uh, cost effectively, we can work with you with a software, a software only model. Okay. And what hypervisors are supported with Pivot3? Today we support uh, vSphere. Uh, we are in the process of uh, starting to support Hyper-V pretty soon. Okay, excellent. And then Edward just sent in a question. He's asking, or actually he's commenting, he's delighted to see the cost saving potential with Pivot3. How quickly can they be realized? I mean, what kind of cost savings have you seen companies realize by adopting Pivot3? So you would see cost saving, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, one of the things we do uh, is reduce the hardware required to support the same workload. I'll give you an example. In one of the deployments, you know, a competing solution was needing 128 nodes. And our solution came there with 84 nodes providing comparable uh, performance and comparable outcomes. Uh, so, right, so the hardware cost saving that you would realize there are, are immediate. And over time, you would also realize as a result administrative cost savings. Very nice. Very nice. So, can you talk a little bit about the migration process? I mean, say somebody has an aging you know, SAN of some kind and some aging vSphere host, how would they, how do they typically migrate to Pivot3? Yeah, with Pivot3, that's quite simple. Uh, it, it, uh, really, I mean, using a standard Swift high uh, uh, uh protocol, using things like vMotion, you can move stuff around. We also offer uh, professional services on those migration sorts of uh, engagements. So it's a, it's a very, it, it's a how, it's similar to how you would move data in, uh, across a virtual environment, we do offer services to do that. Uh, really, I mean, it, it, we, we, keep it, we make it simple by making sure that we're using industry standard uh, protocols uh, to facilitate that sort of data exchange. 
Okay. And then another question came in, does Pivot3 provide NFS and, N and SMB? I guess, can you use it for file sharing or file services? Uh, out of the box, we have an ice uh, block storage. Uh, when you look at just the storage part, uh, part of it, uh, but you could uh, keep, you can maybe chime in more how you would do file share on top of it. Yep, it's very easy with a Windows machine, just fire up uh, file shares to the data, whether it's NFS or and or um, SMB. So you can do the file sharing quite simply. Okay, and then Larry's asking, how's the licensing, what's the licensing model with Pivot3? The, the licensing is, uh, uh, is a one-time licensing and then uh, an ongoing maintenance. So when you buy a software, that's going to be a one-time charge. Uh, when you buy uh, an appliance, that's going to be a one-time charge. Uh, you, would, uh, uh, you would, like any other vendor, you would uh, buy support and maintenance on top of it. As long as you have support and maintenance, you'll keep getting the updated software bits and new functionality as you make it available. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, uh, I think that's all the live questions we have. It's a really great presentation. Thank you so much for being on today, Vikram and Keith. Thank you. Thank you. For more information on Pivot3, check out the handout that's available right there in your audience console. Uh, that handout is a, a lab review of the Pivot3 Acuity solution, and it covers how uh, the Acuity solution is used to perform high performance, uh, advanced quality of service. Make sure you check out that resource and download that. Also, of course, visit the Pivot3 website for more information. And now it's time for another gift card and a grand prize giveaway. So we have our next set of winners. We have a Amazon $500 gift card going out to Aaron James from Michigan. Congratulations, Aaron from Michigan. And our next grand prize winner is David Hatcher from California. Congratulations, David from California. David Hatcher from California and Aaron James from Michigan. More winners being announced after our next two presentations. So if you didn't win, no worries, stick around. It's time to introduce our next presenter on today's MegaCast. That is Mr. Greg Kleiman, Senior Director of Product Marketing at Datrium. Greg, are you with us? I am. Hi, David. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being on. Take it away. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I'm here, I'm going to describe uh, how to transform your enterprise with an integrated cloud platform from Datrium. So when we talk to customers, um, they often tell us that kind of we're all living in this instant economy. Um, and, uh, you know, companies like Amazon and Uber and Netflix have um, really reset the bar. Um, and everyone now uh, kind of expects products instantly. They want instant gratification, whether it's information or products, uh, and users really have um, kind of have no patience anymore. Um, and basically, enterprises are being forced through a transformation in order to serve this instant economy, and everyone's having to become a software company and a data company. Um, and that's really put um, a tremendous amount of pressure on IT. Um, customers now really expect um, instant uh, applications, uh, they ex and obviously the CFOs in the companies expect to spend very little money, um, and uh, they, you know, the the web and services are now 24/7. So really, there's there should be no downtime as far as users are concerned. Uh, they should be able to get up at two o'clock in the morning and check something, and it should work. Uh, so there's no more time to take things offline and do maintenance and backups. Um, and IT is really being um, pushed to be more agile and be more responsive to the business. Um, uh, however, a lot of IT folks uh, still have to deal with, uh, you know, uh, uh, legacy architectures and, and the infrastructure they already have, and they're forced in kind of into a reactive mode. Uh, they're still sometimes viewed as cost centers, and really they spend a lot of their time just trying to keep the lights on. Um, and so this is, uh, why is this? Um, and really it's, it's, it's a result of, of, of kind of the, the investments and the way that we've gotten to where we are. Uh, there are many, many third-party products and many different products for solving different problems. 
Um, and then um, also users sometimes don't get exactly what they want and then they go to the public cloud to get it. So there's also this concept of shadow IT. Um, and all of this is creating, um, it's making it very hard for IT professionals to kind of be strategic business partners to their, uh, their customers. Um, so let's, <coughs> excuse me, uh, pull apart this a little bit uh, and think about for all these different products, what is impacted? Um, so obviously there's a whole set of things that, um, that are around running applications. Um, right, so it's about performance, it's about managing storage, it's about the network, um, and those all impact uh, the way that IT can run applications. Um, also, things like key management and encryption um, uh, affect the ability to secure the data and protect the environment. Um, things like backup um, have, uh, have a lot to uh, impact um, the ability to recover. Um, and then finally, uh, disaster recovery uh, obviously is our ability to, um, to recover um, and bring back when we, when we get into a situation where uh, we are in a disaster. Um, and so as you think across these things, your ability to run, secure, protect, and recover, um, really what you want is all those things to work together instead of being in different silos where they don't work together. And that's in fact what Datrium does. Um, so we bring the three things together uh, with the ability to run, protect, recover, and secure your applications in a single place. Um, and this is very powerful and this allows our customers to uh, really kind of provide this instant gratification to their users. So let me dive in a little bit and explain kind of how we do that. There's really three different pieces. Um, and the first is on the left, and that's the DVX, and that's an on-premise uh, solution. Um, and we'll dive some more into detail, but it's, it, there's software that runs on the host, and there's uh, data nodes where the data is protected. Um, and it's very important that um, the protection and the encryption and the deduplication and the, and the compression all happen on that host when the application is first writing its data uh, because that then allows us to carry that, those characteristics through the rest of the system. The second piece, obviously, once you have a, an operating application with, on a host in an application that's running well, you have to get that data somewhere else in case you lose that host. Um, so you can send it to another corporate site um, or you can send it out to the cloud. And so the Cloud DVX product is for customers who want to send their data to the cloud. Um, and it carries with it all of the things that we talked about, the ability to run, protect, recover, and secure the data across uh, onto the public web on AWS. And then the third piece of the puzzle is CloudShift. And that allows you to orchestrate the movement of workloads and data uh, between sites uh, and out to the cloud if you want to use um, uh, VMware Cloud on AWS as your DR site. Uh, so I'll drill down into those each of those components now to explain how they work, but there's really three pieces to the puzzle, but because it's a integra single integrated system, they all work together. So let's start with the left-hand side, which is the on-premise solution. Um, and as I mentioned, um, it's very important uh, in terms of running the applications, um, that you're able to uh, keep that data local on the host. Um, so we, that's the way the, the software works that's on the host from Datrium. You can run mixed workloads because they're going to run on different hosts so they won't interfere with each other. Uh, because the data stays local uh, in an SSD on the same host where the application is running, you get very low latencies. Uh, so you get very fast performance for those inpatient users. Um, also, you get the ability to scale your system. As you add more hosts, you get more performance. So the system actually gets faster as you grow it. Um, and it gets rid of all the network um, bottlenecks because there's no data happening, uh, transferring between the hosts. All the data is down to the data nodes, which is where it's protected. Um, so the, in, the encryption, the compression, the dedupe, uh, 
um, all, and the protection all happens on the host, and then as it protects the data, it writes it out to a second set of nodes so that it's not on that host, so that the hosts are stateless. So that if you lose the host, you just bring up another host, restart your application, point it to the data, and you're back up and running. Um, so the features of are always on, um, performance goes up, and you're able to run mixed workloads uh, across the system um, as you grow. Uh, the second piece is the protection layer. Uh, and so this operates at various different uh, locations. Uh, for some customers, right, they can run it all in a single data center, so the data nodes act as that protection layer. Um, and because those data nodes are on the part of the same system with the host, uh, when you need to, and that's where the backups are kept, uh, there really is no backup window. The, the system can snapshot anytime without any impact because they're all redirect on writes. Um, you can also, because the, the, the snapshot is sitting right next to the, the data, uh, you can point your VM at that snapshot uh, instantly. And so you can basically recover your data instantly. There's no pulling data back from a, from a separate system. Um, so you get uh, instant recovery um, and uh, no backup window. And then for customers who want to send their data to a second data center, uh, the DVX will automatically replicate to a second DVX uh, such that if you lose an entire site, uh, again, you can instantly recover because your applications are there, you restart them, your data is there, you point it to the data, and you're back up and running. Um, so the instant recovery and the no backup window work across sites, and they also work out to the cloud. So all the same features uh, work to AWS, um, where we can back up the data to AWS if you don't have a second data center or you want to use AWS as your uh, backup location. That's what Cloud DVX does. You can search across all your sites and the cloud to find your backups uh, instantly. And so you have a, the ability to globally search the system um, and uh, find those, uh, find what you're looking for. Um, and then you can recover it instantly. Uh, so that, that protection and that ability to recover instantly is built into the system, and it's all one system. So it's not a separate system, so you can uh, recover very quickly. And that obviously leads to zero downtime and, and helps you with this instant economy. Um, the final piece of the puzzle is the uh, cloud shift. And this is basically uh, software as a service uh, that does the orchestration of moving workloads, whether it's between two sites um, or between a site and a VMware cloud on AWS. Um, it's completely automated. It's a single click to run it. You set up your runbooks ahead of time. Um, you can test those runbooks. Um, because we're end-to-end -end and we're aware you know, from every application, we know what that application is and where its data is, uh, we can actually do compliance checks to make sure that your runbook is going to work um, and so that when you do have a DR event, we can guarantee you it's going to work. Uh, if it's not going to work, we will raise an alert and we will let you know, hey, you know, the network changed over at your second site or, hey, someone reconfigured your VMware cloud on AWS and it's not the same now, and so when you fail over, it's not going to work. Uh, we can tell you that ahead of time to make sure that when you do have a DR event, um, it will be fail-proof and it will work. Um, so those are, those are very powerful. There's really no other DR solution that can kind of do that end-to-end -end check for you. Um, also, because the, um, the data is on both sides, we can instantly uh, bring it back up. Uh, as soon as the workload's there, we can fail you over to a second site, um, and we can make sure that um, all of your snapshots and all of your, um, because we can take instant snapshots of an entire VM uh, and a set of VMs even, in, as which we call a protection group, uh, you can bring those things back together. So in the classic example where you have a web app and a database uh, that have to be in sync, we can snapshot those together so that when you recover them, you come back to a consistent point in time. Uh, and that's obviously very important in a DR event um, because you don't want to have to spend time reconfiguring and resyncing things. Um, and so that's the third piece of the puzzle, uh, which is the CloudShift product. Um, there's really two different deployment models that our customers uh, use for uh, Datrium. Uh, one is software-defined hyperconverged, 
Um, and that's for customers who want kind of an entire solution um, with the host, the servers, and the, and the storage uh, kind of integrated together into a package. And then our, we have other customers who say, you know, we're all set on the host side. Uh, we really just need to refresh our storage. Uh, and so those are customers who have a, a more storage uh, view of, of, of the system, and they, they can deploy our software uh, equally well. Um, if we dig into those things a little bit, um, on the software-defined side, it's important to note that the compute and the capacity scale separately um, so that you can scale your performance and you don't necessarily have to scale up your storage and vice versa. You can scale up the storage layer and leave the compute side alone. Um, also, because it's a completely software-defined solution, you can use existing hosts. And we have many customers that do that, so you don't have to spend money to buy new, new servers if you don't want to. Um, and because we use erasure coding on the host before we write the data to the data nodes, um, everything is very uh, safe, very resilient to failures, uh, but also very inexpensive and very cost effective. Um, on the software side, um, Again, uh, here's a little different. These customers usually um, are not able to manage at the VM level, whereas Datrium software manages everything at the virtual machine level, uh, so there's no storage lines. Um, because we keep the data on the host in SSDs, there's very low latency, so we can run mixed workloads uh, without any bottlenecks that you see on traditional um, storage systems. Um, and um, finally, Performance actually goes up uh, as you add more hosts uh, versus, uh, again, there's no bottleneck uh, built into the system on the, on the uh, controller side. Um, also, um, all of our customers kind of um, have a mixed environment and Datrium supports that. Uh, we can support uh, multiple different container technologies, uh, VMware ESX being a big one. We also support Docker and Red Hat. Um, we have all, almost all of our customers consolidate their workloads over time, so they might start out with EDI, but then they add their enterprise applications like SAP or SQL Server or Oracle. Um, and then um, also many of our customers um, are kind of more uh, DevOps related, and they are already moving aggressively to uh, kind of a, a, a third uh, generation uh, with containers and big data. And so our technology works well with that as well. Um, we're very flexible um, because it's software defined and it all runs industry standard stuff. Um, our system um, supports mixed workloads and most of our customers run it that way. Um, I mentioned performance earlier. We have benchmarks to, sh to prove that you know, we have very good performance as you might expect. Uh, you know, because we're keeping the data on local SSDs, we have very low latencies. Uh, this is a benchmark we did with Dell and VMware. Um, it's called IOMark, where we were 10 times uh, the number of VMs that anyone else had, so we can scale up our system better than anyone else. Um, we were five times faster than the fastest all-flash array at one-third the latency. And it's probably important to uh, point out that all of the features were on. So we had compression, we had dedupe on, we had encryption turned on. Uh, and erasure coding. Um, so whereas our competitors in this performance benchmark didn't have encryption turned on, for example, and maybe didn't have dedupe turned on. Uh, so those are things that are on on our system all the time um, in order to make it efficient and uh, secure. Um, this is a, a quick look at our dashboard, um, and it's uh, very intuitive, uh, but it also shows you quickly that you can do both. On the left side is kind of the virtual machine view. You can see what your latencies are like, what your throughput and IOPS are. You can see how many VMs you have. You can see how they're organized. Uh, you can then set them up into protection groups. Um, as I mentioned, you can, um, you, know, you can do that on a logical basis. So like all your, your database that goes with a certain app can be in the same protection group so that when you snapshot, you get a consistent point in time recovery. Um, and you can have um, 1.2 million uh, snapshots in our system, um, and uh, it scales up to 128 nodes. Um, oops, went backwards rather than forwards. As you might expect, um, 
Uh, because our system is so flexible and so cost effective, the return on investment is very good. We recently published a study uh, with IDC uh, that showed that you get, a, you get your money back in five months uh, on a day term system. Um, this, is, this is really driven by the, uh, the, the productivity of the end users because we can provide a very low latency performance. You know, the users uh, that, of applications that are running on Daytrium get much faster response time, so they're much more productive. Uh, IT is much more productive as well because it's, it's all integrated into a single system, so they don't have different systems they have to go to, so they have less management time, they can recover applications faster. Um, and then because it's very flexible, allows you to use existing servers and run mixed workloads, uh, it's very efficient and saves money on the, um, on the actual cost of the infrastructure. Uh, so all of these things uh, or, uh, contribute to a really good return on investment uh, for customers. Um, also, you see across hundreds of customers the same kind of uh, benefits. Um, we have... Um, five or ten times faster application performance because we're keeping the data local on the host uh, so it doesn't really have to go anywhere. Uh, because our backups are also on the same system, locally on the same, uh, in the same protection layer, we can recover ten times faster. Um, and because really there's no storage to manage, um, the IT guys save lots of time um, because the, you manage everything at the virtual machine layer. There is no, there's no storage artifacts in the system. It's all automatically done for you. Um, we also have um, uh, customers who review us on Peer Insights, which is a Gartner service. Uh, so we have the highest rating in our category, uh, 4.9 out of 5, with over 70 reviews. Um, and so you know, our, our customers are very happy. Um, because they see all these benefits and get their return on investment. Um, so with that, uh, really, with a single platform that is able to run, protect, recover, and secure your applications, IT can make the transition to being a strategic business partner and meeting the needs of, these, uh, of the instant economy. So with that, I think we'll uh, take some questions. Yeah, great presentation, Greg. Let's see, we do have some questions here for you from the audience. While we do that, I'm going to pop up this poll question. The poll question on the screen says, what additional information would you like about the Datrium solution? I'll just leave that up while we do some Q&A here. Um, Joy is asking, and maybe you, you alluded to this a little bit in the business value resource you mentioned, um, but Joy is asking, you know, this seems sufficient and man, uh, manageable, but how do you justify the cost? especially for a smaller organization? Yeah. Um, so the, the cost justification comes in a couple of ways. Uh, one, obviously, it depends what you're comparing against. Um, but our ability to use existing servers, uh, many of our customers save a lot of money that way. Um, and then also for customers who don't have a second data center, which on the small side is some, you know, we can also leverage the cloud, which is very cost effective for backup. Um, and then thirdly, uh, because um, all of our customers get a, a, an application performance boost, um, they, their users are more productive. And usually, in many cases, that's users that generate revenue for the company, people who work in a factory or work at customer service, you know, the, or if it's a medical facility, they're doctors and, um, and nurses. Uh, so the, their ability to respond faster to the business's customers usually drives revenue. Um, so we can help drive revenue, we can help lower costs, and then the final piece of the puzzle is making IT much more productive uh, because they don't have to manage storage, they can recover applications much faster, and it just saves them a lot of time to have all these functions integrated into a single system, and that makes IT much more productive, which saves the company money. Okay, great. Let's see, George is asking, how easy is it to integrate existing servers? So. If I wanted to implement Datrium, would it replace an existing SAN, and then those servers would point to Datrium, or would I replace the servers and the SAN? Can it, how does that work? Yep. Uh, well, so either way works, um, but at a high level, he's right. You basically think about replacing your SAN. You put in Datrium uh, data nodes for that, 
And then if you already have your host, you don't have to buy new ones. You just put Datrium software on your host, existing host, and then they talk to the data nodes and the system works automatically. Uh, if you were in a situation where you wanted to add new hosts, um, or you could keep the ones you have and maybe add some more later, um, that works as well. So the system is very flexible um, in terms of using existing hosts, uh, and you can mix them too. Um, you know, you can take the ones you already have and then add new ones, and they can be from different vendors and different, you know, different configurations. Some can have more SSDs and be very powerful because maybe it's running a database, and other ones can be lower end servers that have very little flash and very little memory and very little CPU because maybe they don't run a, a heavy workload. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's see, another question here from Brian. He's asking if you have any options for organizations that have a large central data center and then multiple smaller branch offices with perhaps only a few terabytes of data at each branch. Yep. Yeah, so we have customers today that are just like that. Um, and the system um, automatically uh, replicates data between two, lo you know, two pl places. So, for example, you'd have... Um, your central DVX and your central data center, you'd have s smaller DVXs out at your remote offices, uh, and then um, the replication would happen automatically uh, between those remote locations and the central office, so you would automatically have all your data back at your central location where you could manage it and do whatever you want to do with it. Uh, so that's the way the system works. Uh, there are some, as you might expect, for if it was a remote office where you didn't have good connectivity, there are some settings. Uh, you can adjust a little bit for very low bandwidth connections, um, and the system will tolerate that. You know, if it drop, if you lose a connection, it'll restart things later in terms of the replication, and all that happens automatically. Okay. Uh, Gary's asking if we are running VMware on premises and using AWS as a recovery site, do we need to have VMware on AWS deployed, or, or I guess he's asking, can you just use AWS, or how does that work? So Yep. Yeah. So it's it's either, it depends on your requirements. It works either way. So if you want to, um, if you just want to use uh, AWS as a backup location, you would use Cloud DVX. Uh, if you wanted to use AWS, if VMware Cloud on AWS as kind of a um, on-demand DR, where you know you wouldn't buy, um, as probably you know, VMware Cloud on AWS. There's two ways you can buy it, right? You can buy it on a per hour basis, or you can buy an annual license. Um, and we work either way. So if you want to buy the hourly thing, basically what you would do is you would wait until you have the DR event, <laughs> and then you would go buy the, the, uh, the instances on VMware Cloud. Um, as soon as you brought those up, you would point them to the Cloud DVX software, and you could be up and running. So you know it might take you 20 minutes to do all the work to bring up those instances, but your data is already there and then you could be up and running. Um, obviously, that's much, much less expensive, but it's not instant recovery. And then the final way you could deploy it is you would have, you would buy an annual license for VMware Cloud AWS. You would have those instances sitting there waiting. You'd have your application sitting there waiting. The data would already be there. So then you could instantly fail over. Obviously, much more expensive, uh, but then you, CloudShift would automatically fail you over to VMware Cloud. Um, and so you'd be literally, you know, it would take like a minute uh, to fail over, so you'd be back up and running. Um, so it can, it, uh, our services work in all three scenarios. Nice, nice, all right. Uh, another question from William, he's asking, can you set up a custom RPO and RTO? A custom? Um, or do you have any controls or like way to, way to predict that or? Well, the R, uh, yeah, I guess you could. Um, although the, you know, the system is, so the RPO is completely under uh, your control because you set the, 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 you know, how often you take your snapshots, right, uh, down to uh, every 10 minutes. So anything more than 10 minutes, you decide how often you want. So RPO is completely configurable um, depending on where you want to set it. Uh, most of our customers do it very often because it doesn't take any, really any incremental space because everything is deduped. Um, and it's, it, it doesn't have any impact on performance because they're redirect on write. Uh, so most of our customers do very low RPOs. Uh, in terms of RTO, um, the, the, um, rep, the, the snapshot is sitting on the system, 
Um, so it's really however long it takes you to uh, log into the system and start up your VM again and point it at the new data. Uh, for most of our customers, that's under a minute. But if you wanted it to be longer, you just wait longer before you brought up the VM. And then as soon as the VM is up, you point it at the data, you'd be back up and running. Okay. Nice. Nice. Very cool stuff. Well, I think that's all the live questions we have. Uh, great presentation. And thank you so much for being on today, Greg. Thank you for having me. For more information on Datrium, of course, visit datrium.com. Also check out the handout that's available for download right there in your audience console. That handout is an IDC report uh, that covers how Datrium generates substantial business value by providing high performance and self-protecting uh, enterprise storage and compute. All right, excellent. Well, not, it's time for another prize giveaway. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going out to Elma Lorento from Tennessee and a grand prize. One of these new Samsung phones going out to Tim Henderson from Ohio. Congratulations to Tim. Now make sure you stay tuned. We have one more gift card and two more grand prizes to give away after our next presentation. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Anker Desai, Director of Products at Robin. Anker, are you with us? Yes. Thank you, David. Thanks for being on. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. This is Ankur from Robin Systems. And uh, today we are going to talk about um, hyperconverged Kubernetes uh, for big data, databases, and EIML. Uh, so now the, the concept of hyperconvergence is, uh, is, has been around for a while, but in the context of Kubernetes, it's pretty new. Uh, so let's talk about uh, you know, what that means uh, for Kubernetes. So let's take a look at you know, the, the traditional hyperconverged infrastructure uh, uh, concept. Um, traditional HCI brings together um, storage, compute and network in a, in a single system, right? Uh, typically in a virtualized fashion, so you would have software-defined storage, a hypervisor, and software-defined network, and you will use that system to manage your virtual machines. Uh, now the industry as a whole is moving away from virtual machines uh, to containers. The reason being containers are lightweight, uh, they don't package the operating system, so you know it's really easy to spin them up, it's, it's really easy to uh, scale a containerized environment, and it's also very easy to port a container from, let's say, on-prem to cloud or vice versa, right? So the industry as a whole is moving towards containerization and, uh, you know, a containerized application environment. Uh, so in that context, wouldn't it make sense to replace the traditional hypervisor with Kubernetes, right? And that's what we have done. So in the context of Kubernetes, you know, the, the hyperconvergence is a pretty new concept. In fact, Robin is the first platform uh, to bring this um, kind of system, this kind of architecture to market. So here what we have is, basically we have replaced the traditional hypervisor with Kubernetes. And the reason we have done that is, uh, you know, as, as the industry is moving towards containers, you have to choose the best container orchestration platform out there to manage your containers, right? And that's what we have done. So, so the software-defined storage part and the software-defined network part remain the same, uh, but the orchestration and the management of containers now is done by Kubernetes. And you, as you can see here, the operating system is now also virtualized, so it, it comes a level below, and your applications run using containers and pods. So the applications are really lightweight, they are portable, you know, we can spin them up uh, within literally seconds and you can actually move them across clouds really easy. So that's the benefit of um, bringing Kubernetes into the mix and going to a containerized world over a virtualized, uh, virtual machine world. So let's take a look at a quick look at our architecture. Uh, uh, let's, we start with Kubernetes, and I would like to mention that you, know, you can run Robin wherever you would like, uh, including on-prem and in the cloud. Um, so we are not an appliance. We are software-defined hyperconvergence. What that means is you can run us 
run the Robin platform uh, on AWS or on-prem or even your VMware um, uh, defined tooling, right? Um, so we start with Kubernetes, that's uh, the core orchestration platform, and we build around it. So our platform comes with built-in storage that provides all enterprise grade features such as snapshots, uh, you know, cloning, uh, setting up quality of service, um, all of uh, the things you would need uh, to run mission critical applications on Kubernetes. We also bring in uh, software defined storage uh, with OVS and Calico. So this is flexible networking um, um, solution that gives you persistent IPs uh, that are required to run stateful applications on Kubernetes. And on top of all of these, uh, these three infrastructure level components, uh, we have our application workflow manager. So this is the brain behind the operations. Uh, if you have, if you're familiar with, uh, you know, deploying Cloudera or Hortonworks or Oracle Rack, these are very complex deployments, right? With Robin, you would have a simple app store and deploying all these complex applications would be as simple as, you know, clicking on an application in the app store and, you know, Robin takes care of the rest. Everything else is automated. You know, it's that simple as maybe going to the app store on your iPhone and downloading an app, right? Uh, so we'll actually see the demos of how this works uh, because, you know, uh, you have to see it to believe it. Um, but this is the architecture uh, in a simplified uh, way. This is, this is the architecture in a nutshell. So now moving forward, uh, let's see what you can do with Robin. So with Robin, you can, you know, using one single click, you can deploy any big data uh, or database application, either on-prem or in the cloud. You can manage the life cycle of the entire app. Uh, in things like, you know, snapshots, uh, clones, backups, upgrades, uh, scaling up and down. Uh, all of these are one-click operations um, in the Robin UI. And then, with Robin, since we are built on Kubernetes, by default we bring uh, the multi-cloud portability to the platform. So you don't have to be locked into a vendor, including Robin. We are not modifying Kubernetes in any way. So um, you completely avoid vendor lock-in and you can port your applications um, you know, on your favorite cloud or um, you can keep them on-prem um, based on your requirements. So let's take a, let's take a look at the first use case. Uh, you know, let's try and deploy a, a big data application. In this case, Hortonworks using the Robin um, platform. So without Robin, you know, there are multiple steps involved. Uh, when, you, when you're trying to deploy something as complex as Hortonworks or HTTP, uh, you know, the, the, you have to create IT tickets, you have to find the right container images for all the services within uh, that platform. Um, configure the containers, make sure they work well together. All of, the, all of these steps can take you maybe a week or more. With Robin, you simply log in. You see your own private app store. Right? Robin provides um, uh, default images, default application bundles within the app store, including Hortonworks. So you just have to click on it, and you're ready to go. So this is, you know, I'm, I'm inside the Robin platform. Uh, clicked on Hortonworks. Now how to provide some simple inputs, like you know what I would like to name my application, and then comp uh, Hortonworks is a complex uh, uh, platform, right? So I will choose the services I need. So in this case, I'm going to turn on Hive and Kafka. I'm going to set uh, CPU resources for data node, uh, and I'm simply going to just say provision application. Now all the complexity that goes with uh, deploying something like Hortonworks, all of that has been automated by Robin and it runs in the background and within a few minutes, so in this case it was just 12 minutes, within a few minutes you will have the entire uh, deployment up and ready to use. Right? So this takes away a lot of complexity, a lot of uh, you know, um, process uh, from deploying complex applications like Hortonworks. So by bringing in the concept of hyperconvergence to Kubernetes, and applying it to containers, we are actually simplifying day-to-day -day operations for big data operators. The next use case would be snapshots and clones uh, for the entire application plus data. So 
uh, snapshots are typically used uh, to you know um, uh, to roll your application back to a point in time, so recover from a mistake. Whereas clones are used to collaborate between teams. So if you have uh, you know dev environment, you can create a clone. Uh, of the entire environment and give it to the QA, right? So you, they would have the exact same environment to work on. They don't have to worry about getting to the stage where their environment actually matches the dev environment, right? So we are simplifying um, the collaboration between different teams. Uh, once again, without Robin, you know, there are multiple steps involved. You have to talk to the storage admin for the storage snapshots. Uh, you have to then, you know, take care of your application um, containers and then make sure you know you bring the containers back up with the right snapshot and it all works together well. With Robin it's as simple as just logging into the app store and clicking on the application that you want to clone and snapshot and you're ready to go. So let's take a look at the demo here. Here we have a Cassandra application up and running uh, and I'm going to now create a snapshot of that application. Right? I simply say manage and create a snapshot. I'm going to name my snapshot, and Robin should take care of everything else in the background. You can actually also create a schedule for your snapshot, so every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whenever you need it. Uh, now the snapshot is created. Let's try and create a clone of the snapshot. Right? So cloning and snapshotting in the context of Robin is uh, redirect on write method, so we are not utilizing any additional storage. Uh, at the same time, you know, when you create a clone from a snapshot, you actually create an, a completely new environment uh, with the compute um, added on top of it. So if I create a clone of the Cassandra dev cluster, uh, I can simply then give it to the QA team with the exact same environment, including the configuration, uh, the number of nodes Cassandra has, and the data inside it. So within minutes now, you can actually collaborate among your teams. Uh, you can trade environments, uh, and the clones are independent of each other. So you can actually start working on the clone without disrupting the original application. Right? Uh, as we can see here, it's the exact replica of the Cassandra dev um, application uh, with the storage volumes created re uh, for, uh, for the clone. The next use case is scaling the applications. So scaling applications like, uh, in this context, we will see uh, applications like Hortonworks. Scaling them is not easy, especially, uh, you know, um, because you have to uh, consider separate roles each service plays, right? So if it's a data node, you want to scale it out by adding more data nodes, uh, whereas for a role like name node, you want to scale it up by adding more CPU and memory. You can do both with Robin, and we'll see how simple it is, right? So we just have to um, adjust sliders. So here we have an um, Hortonworks application running. Simply go to the application. And now we have the option of uh, selecting the QoS. So the, for the name node, we are going to say, hey, we just want to scale it up because we see it's under a lot of stress. Uh, we are going to add more CPU and more memory to the name node. Simply sli use the sliders and say OK. And then literally within seconds, your name node has scaled up. So in this case, it only took us two seconds to scale it up. So that's once again, it coming back to uh, the, the benefits of containers over virtual machines. This is a major benefit, right? So containers are lightweight and they're flexible. It's really easy to spin the containers up as compared to um, virtual machines. And that benefit actually then, you know, um, is brought to lifecycle operations such as scaling up and, you know, upgrading. So um, to wrap it up, um, you know, with Robin, you can focus on your applications and not worry about your infrastructure. Right, so we we talk in terms of applications. You know, you saw all the demos where we're talking about Hortonworks and Cassandra, uh, and not about storage volumes and you know um, CPUs and and uh, networking. Right, so all of that has been taken care of by Robin for you. You just use your private app store to take care of your applications. Um, and once again, uh, what are the benefits of doing that? 
uh, you can deploy any any stateful application on Kubernetes uh, in data center or or in public cloud within minutes. Uh, you can manage lifecycle uh, operations for uh, your applications uh, using one-click operations, uh, as we just saw using sliders. Um, and then uh, you avoid vendor lock-in and bring multi-cloud portability to your environment. And with that, uh, I would rec I would request you to uh, go to Robin.io to see more demos. We have, uh, you know, more solutions uh, listed on our website, and each solution has its own demos associated with it, including uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Oracle, Oracle Rack. Uh, and big data um, deployments such as Hortonworks and Cloudera. Additional information, what do you like about the Robin solution that you saw today? If you don't mind answering that, we would appreciate it. And a question from the audience, they're asking, could the customer application be deployed in the hybrid cloud? So is Robin an on-premises solution, or how, how does that work exactly? So we are... Uh, uh, we are cloud or on-premise agnostic. So the way you would deploy it on hybrid cloud is Robin has a concept called resource pools. So when you, let's say, let's start with on-prem, right? So when you deploy Robin on uh, maybe 10 servers on-prem, what we do is we create resource pools. So you can create a pool uh, that includes all of your uh, infrastructure or you can create multiple pools that will separate pieces of the infrastructure. The way to do a hybrid cloud with Robin is create a resource pool that will have a few servers on-prem and a few servers in the cloud, such as AWS, right? When you do that, you basically have, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, an environment that stretches across on-prem and cloud. The other way to do it is basically create two separate resource pools uh, within the same uh, Robin cluster. So one resource pool would be AWS resources. The other resource pool would be the on-prem resources. And then you can uh, set rules on, you know, uh, w whenever you try to deploy an application, Robin gives you the uh, the option to choose the resource pool, right? So you can uh, deploy certain applications on AWS and certain applications on on uh, on prem, as well as when you're creating snapshots and clones, uh, you have the option of selecting where that snapshot will reside and the clone will reside. So you can have your um, original application on prem and you create a clone in the AWS. A resource pool. Um, so we do provide uh, comprehensive hybrid cloud options uh, to our customers, uh, and it's really easy to set up. Okay, excellent. And another question here, uh, can you tell us about what customers are using Robin in production? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, so we have uh, multiple customers using Robin in production. Uh, a few examples would be uh, uh, Fortune 100 insurance company USAA um, and uh, banking um, company BNP Paribas, uh, they're using uh, Robin for um, containerizing their elastic stacks. Um, then we have Sabre uh, using us for consolidating Oracle Rack deployments. Uh, Palo Alto Networks is using us for uh, consolidating their Cloudera deployments, and there are many more. So you can simply visit robin.io and see, uh, you know, the case studies and customer logos on our website. Nice, nice. And what about Kubernetes? Does Robin modify Kubernetes? Is Robin a Kubernetes distribution? Yes, I would say Robin is a Kubernetes distribution, but we don't modify Kubernetes at all. So the way Kubernetes was built, uh, it's it's very flexible in terms of the you know um, the additional components you can plug in. For example, Robin Storage plugs into Kubernetes using something called Container Storage Interface (CSI). So Kubernetes has provided all these interfaces uh, where you can, you know, bring together components outside of the Kubernetes code. So we don't modify Kubernetes at all. It's completely upstream Kubernetes. We are not modifying the code um, uh, related to Kubernetes. We are just using the interfaces provided by Kubernetes, the standard interfaces, uh, to create a complete solution. Uh, that brings simplicity to Kubernetes. Excellent. And that's something I know a lot of companies need, is they need Kubernetes to be a lot easier than it is today. Uh, and you all are really making that easy with the App Store. Another question here, can you add your own application to the App Store? Absolutely, yes. Uh, 
So the App Store we saw in the demos, it comes with uh, you know some default applications up and loaded, but those applications are nothing but simple YAML files. Those are configurable. You can make changes. You can create your own YAML files. For uh, I'll give you an example. So um, a recent customer of ours, they are using Cloudera, but they are using a visualization tool called Arcadia to go with it. So what we did was we created a simple bundle that has in in everything included. So when they click on that application, it deploys Cloudera as well as Arcadia, right? So it's you can create your own custom applications. You can create, you know, uh, you can change the 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 default structure of the Hortonworks application we provide. It's all uh, flexible and configurable. Okay. And can I deploy Robin on existing servers, or do I buy servers and the Robin software from Robin? No, we are so like I mentioned, we are not an appliance, so we are software only solution. So if you have hardware, uh, you know, uh, Robin runs on commodity hardware. You can simply just get the software bits and run on your existing servers. Nice. And what's the easiest way to to try out Robin for yourself? What do you recommend? Um, so go to Robin.io and there is a community edition available as well as there is a free trial available. So in fact, for the free trial, we actually, uh, you know, take care of the AWS bill for you. You get three days uh, access to Robin on AWS. Uh, you can play around with it. The App Store is already populated with default applications, so you can see how easy it is to deploy applications to scale up and down the applications. Uh, and you have the environment for three days, and Robin takes care of the AWS bill for you. The other way to do it is we also have a community edition, which you know you'll deploy on your own AWS account, but that's free for life. So you don't have that three-day limitation there. You use Robin uh, with a three-node cluster, free for life. Uh, then you can play around for a longer time. So this is you know for someone who wants to keep the system around for a while. Nice, nice. Well, that sounds easy. Sounds easy to do. A great opportunity for a lot of folks interested in using Kubernetes and, and doing it the easiest way possible. I, I think that's all the live questions we have, but thank you so much for being on the event today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. For more information on Robin, visit robin.io. Also check out the handout that's available for download there in your console. It's a product brief on the Robin hyper, hyper converged Kubernetes platform. Uh, it has all the details about how it works and the different applications that, that work well on it. So make sure that you check that out. And with that, it's time for our final prize drawing. While I do that, I'm going to pop up this poll question. The question is, what's your time frame for updating your existing infrastructure or adding new infrastructure? Uh, is this something you have planned in the next six months, 6 to 12, 12 to 24, or, or just not sure today? And the prize winners. Let's see, we have a final Amazon $500 gift card going out to Corinne Monshine from Pennsylvania. Congratulations, Corinne. Sorry, Corinne Monshine from Pennsylvania. And then grand prize number four for another Samsung S10 goes out to Harris Herdovic from Iowa. Congratulations, Harris from Iowa. And then final grand prize goes to Chris Lucas from Ohio. Congratulations to Chris from Ohio, Harris from Iowa, and Kareen from Pennsylvania. All right, thank you for answering the poll question on your screen. I will post all the prize winners here in the Q&A in just a moment. Before we go, I want to remind you to check out our 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store to learn about the latest in enterprise tech. Visit events.actualtechmedia.com for upcoming, uh, our, our upcoming event list. You can see all of our Megacast and Ecocast events there, as well as our special webinars that we do uh, on a weekly basis. So make sure you check those out. In fact, our next event coming up is the Disaster Recovery in the Cloud event on April 4th. So make sure you stay tuned to your email inbox for an invitation to that. And if you don't get one, just visit events.actualtechmedia.com. And if you're a potential sponsor of a Megacast or Ecocast event, always feel free to reach out to sales at actualtechmedia.com. I hope that you enjoyed the event. Thank you, everyone who joined us today. I hope that you learned a lot, and I hope that you have a great day. See you next time.